Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. Hello everyone, a quick note before I get started today. I just had another long conversation with Raka Raka Ali that's about four hours long, so that is up on my channel now, but will go up on Raka's too shortly, maybe by the time this episode goes up. We recorded it in different ways, and I think he's putting up his version, so it's just a matter of preference, whether you like to see both of us on screen at once or one of us on screen at a time, but full focus. The latter is my version. It was a fun conversation. We talked about a lot, and we spent a significant amount of time verifying the historical veracity of <laughs> an upcoming song he's doing on the history of philosophy. And we talked about many other interesting things, too. So that's up. I enjoyed it, and we will probably do more things like that in the future. Okay, so for today, the first thing I want to do is address some of the feedback I got on last week's episode about MGTOW. It was mostly, predictably, negative. <laughs> I mean, negative from MGTOW people. Overall, positive. But from that group, I don't think I changed many people's minds. Although, I exclude the person who actually asked me to address the topic. He was quite polite and receptive, so I appreciate that. But in terms of the random MGTOW people who stumbled across the video, they were not receptive. So I want to address some of the most common criticism. I think the most common criticism was that I said that MGTOW are gender egalitarians. They believe men and women are the same. And a bunch of people said, no, we don't believe that. Okay. Well, there are a couple things about this. Number one, it doesn't matter if that's what they preach. I was explaining the motivation for MGTOW. And the motivation is that they struck a bargain with the preachers of egalitarianism and then were betrayed and then retaliated. And yes, many of them now say, oh, well, men and women are different, and they actually think women are inferior in certain ways. I mean, not just physically, but they're inherently uh, frivolous, uh, manipulative. But anyway, the point is, it doesn't matter what you preach. I'm explaining how you got there. Do religious people advocate acting on whim? No. That doesn't mean that's not how they got there. Religious people are people who got burned by the law of identity. They look at the world, they take certain actions, they want those actions to have certain effects, those actions don't have those effects, and now they have a choice. Do they conform to reality, or do they wage war against it, denigrate it in favor of another supernatural realm? And religious people do the latter. Now, that doesn't mean religious people go around advocating whim worship, but it is the desire to whim worship that made them religious and made them hate the natural world. So there's a difference between what motivates you and what you explicitly preach. So that's number one. But number two, a lot of them do believe this. And this is... I have been shotgun blasted with contradictions by these people. I had many of them say, Oh, we don't believe men and women are the same. That's ridiculous. You're getting us all wrong. And then other people come in and say, oh, no, we don't think women are inherently inferior or bad. I don't know any MGTOW who believes that. We just think they act this way because they can get away with it. OK, and the same thing with the concept of going on strike. I have had people stridently insist to me MGTOW is about going on strike. And then other MGTOW come and say it has nothing to do with going on strike. We're not talking about going on strike. Okay. And then people say, well, look, this is a very deep philosophy. I understand if you don't want to get into it, but there are thousands of pages written on this. Now, I have read some of those pages, and that's where the contradictions come from. You people tell me one thing, I look at multiple of your sources, which all contradict each other, 
And you want to use this excuse, well, you have to look at all of it. No, if somebody comes and tells me 2 plus 2 equals 5, I'm not reading a thousand pages to see how he thinks he reconciled that mathematical contradiction. MGTOW is not an interesting enough mistake to warrant that kind of investigation. What does, what would going on strike even do if you think women are just this way? You're not going to change them if this is just biologically ingrained. Oh, you just want to change the laws? Okay. But then I thought your idea was that you don't go along with women, you don't have serious relationships with them because the laws are so against you. But if they're just biologically this way, why would you ever have a serious relationship with women, even if you got the laws to change? That doesn't really seem to make sense with all your arguments that you can get procreation and companionship and sex better elsewhere without a serious relationship. So it really just seems like this is a bunch of BS and excuses you're making. An incoherent mess you're using to rationalize hatred of women because you were burned, because you were told that you're equal, but then you were treated by a double standard. Well, I have sympathy for the unfairness that was visited upon you, but I lose it when you start acting irrationally as MGTOW are now. That is the essence of MGTOW. It is incoherent nonsense. Don't be a MGTOW. I mean, you can tell it's a rationalization because of all the contradictions. It has the character of people just throwing anything and everything at the wall to see what sticks and what will justify their lack of pursuit of serious romantic relationship. Okay, so that's MGTOW. Next, first question today. Do you think intellectual property rights are something the government should enforce? By this I mean patenting an idea such as an app store. I understand that government should protect us from theft and fraud, such as someone stealing from my app store or someone claiming that their app store is mine, i.e. Google starting an app store and deceiving people into thinking it is the Apple app store. But should someone be able to patent ideas and stop others from using those ideas? Yes. Absolutely yes. Intellectual property rights are not some secondary or derivative kind of property. Intellectual property is the exemplar of property. All property is justified because of the intellect, even physical property. How do human beings survive? We use our intellect, even when we're building something uh, physical, like a table. No, you don't have a right to the idea of table when you build a table, because that's an obvious thing to make. But what you are protecting there is the cause and effect relationship between a man's mind and reality. You use your mind in order to create values. You should be able to keep the results of the use of your mind, even if it's not a use that's so novel that the idea should be yours. So what you're protecting with intellectual property versus non-intellectual property is the same thing. It's the connection between the intellect and reality. The whole point of property is to protect the cause and effect relationship between thinking and survival. So there is no better example of something that should be property than a novel, non-obvious, productive idea. An invention or an artwork. Now there are standards. I forget what the court's standards are, but they're is a standard set of standards, and it's non-obvious, etc. So yes, if you come up with an idea that aids human life, and isn't something that's just obvious to everyone, you deserve to be rewarded for coming up with that idea. It's exactly the same reason you deserve to keep a table you built. You used your mind, you created value, you should be the recipient of that value. You should have exclusive rights to the distribution of that idea for a given period of time. It can't go on forever, but you have to protect the relationship between thinking and survival because thinking is actually how we survive. If you come up with a novel idea, you invent the cotton gin, you deserve the rewards of that. It doesn't matter that other people can physically build it. This is the libertarian, disintegrated, subjectivist idea. All that matters is you can duplicate a cotton gin without depriving the inventor of his cotton gin, so therefore it's fine and it's not theft. Wrong. Because what you are stealing from him is not the physical cotton gin, 
It's the rewards of inventing the cotton gin. He's not getting the value he created by coming up with that idea. Other people wouldn't even be able to use a cotton gin or build their own if he hadn't come up with the idea. So yes, they are stealing from him if they use his original, non-obvious, productive idea without his permission within a given period of time, which I think should be life of the intellectual property right holder plus another lifetime for reasons I've gone into before. Now, a couple things about this. First, you can't just have the idea. An idea means nothing if it isn't embodied or manifest in objective reality. This is why you actually have to have your novel written down so that you can get it copyrighted, or you have to have a uh, blueprint or schematic or some kind of plan for building your invention that you can take to the patent office. It has to be embodied in some way. You can't, it can't just be in your head and you have the idea. So this isn't just about ideas. There's an integration here. But if you come up with the idea and then prove it by manifesting it in reality, you own that idea because you were the one who came up with it. Now you say, well, what if somebody else comes up with it independently? Too bad for him. First come, first serve. Now, if there were some way to prove that this other person came up with it independently, fine. But that's simply impossible. It's just simply impossible. There's no way to know once an idea has been put into the public. There's no way of knowing, did this guy somehow get it from the other guy? Even unintentionally, did it, you know, the ideas kind of get passed along through this game of telephone and it sparked the idea? There's just no way of knowing objectively. So it has to be. Just by the requirements of reality, it has to be a first-come, first-serve system. So yes, somebody who comes up with an original idea that meets the standards for intellectual property, he should absolutely have that property enforced by the government. You are not allowed to take somebody's novel and resell it, or to take their invention and build your own. He created the value with his intellect, so he should, in principle... Be the recipient of that value, because that's how human beings survive. We use our mind to create value. So if you let that go, only death can follow. Because for every individual's life, for his own selfish interests, he wants to have the rewards of his own thought. That is the only way to ensure that people can actually survive and be happy. You don't justify intellectual property on the grounds that it benefits society. I don't care about society. I care about me and getting the rewards for what I created. I'm writing several books. I've written some essays. I put my podcast out there. I own all of that. That's mine. And I take personal offense at anyone who wants to say, well, we have a right to take it and duplicate it and sell it because we're not depriving you of anything. Yes, you are. And you have no right. I created it. It wouldn't be there to steal if I hadn't. And you should treat yourself better than to be a parasite on other people. I don't mean this to the questioner. I just mean this of anybody who claims the right to violate intellectual property or who claims intellectual property doesn't exist. Now, as for the app store itself, I don't know. That's a specific question. And my answer to it doesn't have any philosophical implications. That's just a question of a specific concrete. Uh, on the face of it, it seems obvious to have a store for apps, so my off-the-cuff answer would be that I don't think that's something that would be patentable, but I'm not an expert, and maybe that's not as obvious as I think it is, or there's some other issues involved there. But absolutely, if you create value, you should get to keep the value, and that's the whole point of the government because that's how human beings survive. So the whole point of the government is to protect property. And intellectual property is the highest form of property and really the only form of property. Not in the technical sense. There is such a thing as owning a pattern, an abstract thing, but I mean that in the sense that even physical things you produce one of required intellect. And the point of protecting them is not to protect your muscles. We don't survive by using our muscles, not primarily. There are a hell of a lot of animals that are a lot stronger than we are, and they survive not nearly as well as we do. So the whole point is to protect that difference, and the difference is we think. So we have to protect the relationship between thought and value. 
All right, next. I don't have the whole question here, but somebody asked me about Alex Epstein. So I'm just going to talk about him. And I suppose you want to know if I'm critical and why, because I seem to be critical of objectivists in a way no one else is willing to be. So be it. I don't want to be the anti-ARI guy. That's not my interest. But I will criticize him when and as it's appropriate. And in Alex's case, it is appropriate. Here's my main criticism of Alex. He is a sellout. Now, I rarely use that term because usually sellout means, oh, you're just in it for the money now. So there's usually a... Uh, an invalid premise involved with calling somebody a sellout. But with Alex, I mean a philosophical sellout. He is quite happy to let his ideas be misinterpreted in order to be uh, more popular. He was on Dennis Prager. Now, Prager has talked about how he hates Ayn Rand because of her selfishness. Oh, but now Alex Epstein is on his show promoting the moral case for fossil fuels. And what does Alex say? My standard is human flourishing. That's what Alex always says. It's human flourishing. And Prager is just blown away. What a brilliant idea. Human flourishing as the standard. Genius. Just could not praise Alex enough. Now, what the hell do you think Dennis Prager thinks human flourishing is if he hates... Ayn Rand because of her advocacy of selfishness. Obviously, Prager and these other conservatives, Steven Crowder, all these other people Alex uh, deals with, obviously these people are promoting him because they believe human flourishing is compatible with this kind of collectivist altruism. They don't interpret human flourishing as selfish. The way they see it is, oh, this is sacrifice for your fellow man. You tell me what good it does to go out there and convince people that we have to stop sacrificing for spotted owls and rivers so that we can sacrifice instead to other people. Because that's clearly how conservatives are interpreting it. And Alex is quite happy to let that go by. If they knew what he really meant, they would not be so gushing about him. Now, you can't take any single instance of that and condemn Alex for it, but it is clearly a pattern. And when you know that your ideas are being misinterpreted in that way, it's your responsibility to clarify, oh no, Dennis Prager, I mean, let's be selfish. That's the standard. Not let's get rid of nature so that we can sacrifice for the collective of humanity. Let's be selfish. As I say, it does no one any good to go out there and argue that we should change the recipient of our sacrifices. But of course, if Alex went out there and argued for selfishness, he wouldn't be popular. Nobody would talk to him. You know, Alex even goes around calling himself a humanist. That's what he is. Now, that's a terrible term. That has a lot of historical baggage. It comes from the same Auguste Comte style of thinking. You know, he coined altruism and invented this whole religion of humanity. We have to be humanists and sacrifice for the collective of humanity. Humanism is known as collectivism. That's what humanists are. They're just secular collectivists. Pseudo-secular. I mean, you can see Comte turned it into a religion. So at first I thought that was just a bad choice of words, but now I see there's a deeper connection there. Alex is letting himself be interpreted in this way. He's going around calling himself a humanist. Now I know he's saying, well, because we have to care about humans versus animals. Yeah, but individual humans or collective humanity? Because everybody's interpreting you in the latter way, and that's what the term humanist implies. And he doesn't seem to be correcting too many people on that misinterpretation. I have other criticisms as well, but that's the main one. Anyway, I think that's it for today. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.